G'day everyone, Richard Walding here. I'm just going to run over some slides um, from a presentation I did at Griffith Uni. Um, you'll see it down in the corner here. Um, there's the title screen. It was the uh, cutting edge for um, Griffith Uni Teachers Professional Development Day last November 2021. Um, I'll just go to a bigger image. Okay. Um, now I've titled, I titled the talk Rolling Balls and Stacked Magnets. Now I've already done the rolling ball one, which was about inclined planes. And in this video, I'm going to look at the stacked magnets, which was part B, if you like, of the, uh, the talk. Um, the rolling balls and inclined planes one is um, on YouTube and I'll show you the links later on. So this will also, be, this is also on YouTube. That's where you're watching it. Um, and I'll just go through some of the bits and pieces. The whole purpose was to show teachers um, some experiments they can do or students can do for their student experiment as part of the Queensland syllabus um, assessment item called the student experiment. And I'm going to show some or one particular experiment that works really well as a modification and um, we'll see how this goes. Now, I'm calling this one stacked magnets. Now, the whole purpose of this talk is to show teachers and students, if they're watching, um, how you can take one of the mandatory experiments and turn it or and actually modify it for a student experiment. So in senior physics under the Queensland syllabus, um, in unit three, there's a number of um, mandatory and suggested practicals. Um, in the unit on uh, magnetism, there's a couple of um, mandatory ones. So that one of them is to do with uh, forces of a uh, magnet at different distances. And I'm going to look at that. So I'll look at the mandatory one first, and then I'll show how we can modify that to make an interesting student experiment. Okay, so this one will be stacked magnets. Now, by stacked magnets, I just mean putting magnets in a... Um, in a stack rather than using single ones. So here's a bunch of stacked magnets. Look, I'll just go back to this one. And I've got a whole heap of, I just bought those. I think there's 30 magnets there. So you just buy them on eBay or wherever you like. And um, you can stack them. So you can look at one, two, three, all the way up to 30. Okay, so that's a set of stacked magnets. Now, um, I'm going to take this experiment out of um, the the mandatory experiment is written up in my practical manual in the back of the Oxford textbook. And there it is there. So it's, uh, what's that, page 402. And that's just the, the title page. But there's about um, eight pracs in there, the mandatory ones. The suggested ones are in um, the workbook or are online in the O-book. Okay, so there's the cover for the textbook. So that's my unit three and four textbook for Oxford. Um, these pracs are related to unit three, topic two, which is the magnetism one. Okay, now the mandatory prac I'm going to look at from the syllabus is this one. Conduct an experiment to investigate the strength of a magnet at various distances. Now you have to, or teachers have to, interpret what the word strength means and actually what a magnet is. Distances is pretty obvious. Now, in the experiment I have in the textbook for the mandatory one, I'm interpreting strength as to be the force. I'm using strength as to mean force um, between magnets at various distances. Now, so I've said that here. Interpreting strength as force and the magnet as a bar magnet. Now, the reason I've said that here is that um, some people do the experiment, which is the, the the magnitude of the magnetic field around a current, current carrying wire. And they interpret that as the wire, the current carrying wire as the bow magnet or as a magnet. And the strength as being the magnitude of the magnetic field. Now, I don't uh, this. I think this experiment gets closer to what the syllabus was after. But anyway, um, either would be OK. So in this case here, um, the student is measuring the distance between two magnets and one magnet's on a 
um, electronic balance. And so she's measuring the force between them, um, maybe a repulsive force um, or an attractive force, it doesn't matter, um, between the bar magnets and just changing the distance. So here's the, the section out of the textbook um, that I was talking about. So you can see the diagram, I've got a north and a south, so it's an attractive force. So the, um, the mag as the magnet gets closer, the strength or the force gets greater and so it pulls up on the, um, the balance and the balance will go into the negative, but that's fine. Okay, now here's two things we can do. Um, we can keep the magnets the same. So <clears throat> this is the original experiment, if you remember. So I'm just using um, the little, um, the rare earth magnets here, like I, I held up a minute ago. And there's the distance between them. Um, is D1 and the force between them I can say is F1. Now I'm keeping the number of magnets the same, one, one in each case. So all I'm doing is increasing the separation distance. Look here it is to D2 and then to D3. Now you need to do at least five different distances, five manipulations of the independent variable. Um, and then you'd get different forces which would be related to the scale readings on the balances. Okay, so that's that's what the mandatory experiment looks like. Okay, now when you do that experiment, now I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I've done videos on this before. But <clears throat> if you do it and you vary the distance from, here we are at five millimetres. Now that's, you know, you can imagine how close five millimetres is. And it's pretty hard to um, get that done accurately. Five all the way up to say 30 millimetres, three centimetres or so. Um, you'll notice um, there's the data I've got. Now I, I've done this many times before and I've used student experiments, but this works really well. And then I put in a trend line. Okay, I've done a power trend line using Excel and it's given me a power of negative 2.8. So not quite inverse cubed, but not inverse squared, somewhere in between. Okay, now... <coughs> That's using these N45 magnets, the rare earth magnets I was talking about. They're the common ones, and you can get those from just about anywhere. Bunnings is, um, if you need them in a hurry, you can go to Bunnings you know, just for a few dollars. Um, our eight millimetres diameter, three millimetres thick, and they've said to have a surface magnetization, which, uh, well, 0.44 Tesla. Now, um, I've just called that B0 here as the a value um, for the surface. But basically the strength magnetic field at the surface of the magnet. Okay, now <clears throat> the problem is some people will say, if you look up on the internet, some will say, oh, the force between magnets is inverse cubed. And others will say it's inverse squared. And I've seen one before that says inverse to the power of four. And the students say, well, what's right? Which one am I um, using as my accepted? And the answer is, well, they're all right. It all depends on the distance. So let me just show you this. Okay, if you're close in, now let's keep that, in, keep in mind, that's the whole experiment from five up to 30 millimeters. Okay, and it comes out to negative 2.8. If you look at the first part from 5 to 10 millimetres. So that's in this region here, 5 to 10. So if you expand that and just look at the power, the trend line and the, um, the formula for the, the power, it's negative 2.1. So that's almost inverse squared. So inverse squared when you're close in 5 to 10. Let's have a look from 10 to 15 and see what happens. Oh, this is 10 to 20, sorry. So from 10 to 20, from there, across to there. Look, it's inverse cubed, not almost negative 2.9. The question is, what will it be from 20 to 30? Now, you, the trend looks like inverse squared, inverse cubed, maybe inverse to the power of 4 as we go further away. And sure enough, it's getting up close to 4. So the answer to students is that depending on how close the magnets are and the type of magnet, of course, um, the <coughs> well, no, the, how close they are, 
the um, the relationship between force and distance will vary from inverse squared close in to inverse cubed, inverse to the power of four. And so the further away you get, actually, it ends up as power of four exactly. But um, for students in a classroom, anything over, you know, once you get up to big distances, the error, the limitations of the measuring instruments is great. And the uncertainty in the measurement um, starts to overwhelm any accuracy you can possibly get. OK, look, I'll just point out here in the 2020 subject report from QCAA about the um, student experiments and said, should ensure that the experiment collects sufficient data to draw valid conclusions, e.g. at least five data points to establish a trend and three to establish uncertainty. So going back to this, you need five data points. Well, look, I've got you know about 10 data points here, but what I haven't shown is the um, that I've done triplicates. Now, of course, a student doing this will do this experiment. And I'll just go back a, a slide and back to here. A student who's just doing a simple experiment like that would do five, at least five um, variations on the independent variable. So one, two, three, four, five. Look, I've done about 10. But for each one, you do triplicates. So and then you'd have error bars drawn for the um, each of the data points. So just keep that in mind when you're advising students or if students are watching this, stick to what QCAA says, five data points and three trials, in other words, triplicates. Um, OK, so going back to that previous experiment, what you need to do is linearize this experiment here, um, the overall experiment, um, what a student would do and what we suggest to them is to linearize that. So plot, that looks like about inverse cubed or something like that. So let's plot um, x cubed on the bottom versus the force. OK, so here we go. So look, I've done um, x1 on x cubed squared to start with or just to try that out. So that's I'm looking for an inverse square relationship. And a student would do this and say, well, look, that's a pretty good trend line. Almost goes through zero. Um, not much in the way of curves off it. A bit of a curve. That's a bit suspicious. But look at the R squared. It's nice and high. So typically, a student would sum up by saying they've confirmed an inverse square relationship, um, but mention some of the limitations and how well they can generalize that. So now that's the... That's the, the main part. If you try inverse cubed, so you're plotting one on distance cubed on the bottom, look, you're getting a bit of a bend in it. So it's not quite inverse cubed. It's not quite inverse squared because, you, you know, as I said, it varies over the distance. So you're good to examine those sorts of things. Now, a student who's trying to get 20 out of 20, 100% for their student experiment um, would certainly... Um, if they did this sort of analysis, would be looking for top marks. So if I go to 2.8, which seemed to be the trend line um, overall, it's still a, a bit of a curve. So that really highlights the point that it's not a uniform relationship. It varies with distance. So it's not an inverse squared, inverse cubed, or inverse to the power of four. It's, it varies. So that would be the end of your mandatory experiment. So that's what students would have done in class under your guidance, and written it up, and you would have talked about um, how well they discussed errors and so on. Now, that's not, that's not an assessment item. That's just a mandatory experiment for them to um, work on their data, data collection, data analysis, and so on. OK, let's have a look at how this relationship works out now, let's imagine you've got a pair of magnets. Now, um, I'll just show you here. Look, I'll just go back to this. Okay, so it's basically like that. So north, south, and there's an attractive force between the two. Okay, you could also make it south and south, and you'd have a repulsive force. But either way, you're still looking at the forces between two magnets like that. Now, the key thing about this is that 
if you look, there's an attractive force between the north and south. Okay, now most students stop at that stage and say, um, we're going to look at the force between the north and south. So that's the distance between them. Okay, but when you think about it, and this is really stepping it up to the next part, um, and not only do students forget about this, but a lot of teachers and a lot of stuff on the internet forgets about this point. They just treat magnets as being two, basically just a pole and a pole. Okay, so you're looking at the repulsion or attraction between two poles. But what you've also got between, as well as this attraction between north and south, you've got an attraction between the south here and the north at the bottom. Okay, now they're further away, but that's an attractive force. So the force between the north and south on the insides is at a distance x. The force here between the outer south and the outer north is x plus l plus l, so x plus 2l. But you've also got um, re repulsion. So this north here is repelling this north at the bottom. And this south at the top is repelling this south here. So you've got repulsion between those two poles. Now the distance apart for this north here and this north here is x plus l. So that arrow there is x plus l. This arrow here is also x plus l. Now they're inverse relationships so let's inverse squared relationships we're treating this as um, in terms of coulomb's law because after all you've just got circulating currents making up the magnetism so we're treating it as a coulomb's law type of um, repulsion and oh before i go on i was saying students often forget about um, other than the primary the closest pair of poles now, there's an interesting report in um, you know, JRST, which was about chemistry and students forgetting that in an atom, the bonding, um, say an ionic bond, not only do you have the negatives and positives attracting, you've got repulsion between the, the nuclei of two neighbouring atoms. And students and teachers tend to forget about the repulsion. And here, students tend to forget about the repulsion, they forget about everything except the primary set of poles next to each other. So um, keep in mind that there will be repulsion as well. Okay, there's the, um, that's the, re the reference for it if anyone's interested. Okay, so if you look at Coulomb's law, it's inverse squared. So that's the relationship. So let's have a look at the, we'll forget about K at the moment, the um, 9 by 10 to the 9. Let's just have a look at the Q times Q over R squared. In fact, Q doesn't change. So we're not interested in Q. We're interested in the um, distance. So for this pair here, it's 1 over X squared because it's X apart. For this pair here, attraction, it's 1 over X plus 2L, all squared, like I said. And for these two here, it's 1 over X plus L, all squared. You've got two lots of that. So it's 2 over x plus l squared. Okay, so really you've got this first term as attraction, the second term as attraction, the third term as repulsion. So the overall force will be proportional to that plus that minus this one. Okay, you treat that as repulsion, so it's a negative. Okay, so it looks something like this. So the force... Um, is equal to some constant, we'll worry about that later, times um, 1 over x squared and so on, like I just mentioned. Okay, 2 over x plus l at the end, x, x plus l squared, because it's two lots of it. Now, if you go to Wikipedia and look and Google or and search for force between magnets, that formula comes up, or a version of that formula comes up, and Wikipedia is quite reliable. The formula they use is um, an appropriate formula. It works well. It makes sense theoretically. And it's been derived by the people. If you look at the references for who puts it there, it's by physicists. 
it's not just some um, made up thing. Okay, now the constant turns out to be a pi mu zero over four. Now um, that that is a constant. Those values are in the formula book. Um, M is a a formula related to the magnetization, surface magnetization. Okay, so for magnets, the formula, the M in this formula is 2 times B0. Now I told you B0 was about 0.4 Tesla, 0.44 Tesla for those um, rare earth magnets that you get from Bunnings or um, like I was waving around before, these, these magnets here. Um, you know, the, the common um, rare earth magnets. And um, just that B0, it doesn't really matter how it's related to the magnetic remnants, but if you, students want to go into what magnetic remnants is, um, they could look it up and talk about how it's related to B0. But we know B0 is about 0.44. So you substitute all that in. Now, R is the radius of the magnet itself. Uh, I haven't said that there. And um, Now, so the formula, when you substitute in, it comes to that. And this is when X is greater, much, much greater than the radius of the magnets. So the magnets I'm using are about 8 millimetres. So there they are there. Diameter. So the radius would be 4 millimetres. Um, but X, I'm starting off with probably five millimetres, but I'm going up to probably 30 millimetres. So X is much, much greater than R. So that formula is quite OK. OK, um, look, I'll just show you how you do a, a calculation. Now, this is the theoretical value for force. Um, I'm using, say, a nine millimetre meter, nine millimetre gap. So that's X is nine millimetres. The diameter is eight millimetres. So I can get an R value from that. And the length of the magnet itself, the L value is three millimeters. OK, so you put it all together and we get this. Now, I've given you the um, X is nine millimeters, so it's 0 0.0090 meters. So that's the X value, the separation distance. The mu zero is from your um, formula book. From students formula book from QCAA 4 pi by 10 to the negative 7 and R is the radius 4 millimeters which is 0 0.0040 meters okay that's half of the 8 millimeters L was um, 3 millimeters so it's 0 0.0030 meters for each magnet so you substitute all of that in and look what you get. Um, I won't go through the substitution, but it's basically just these values being substituted in there. So for a nine millimeter gap, you're getting a force of about 0.359 newtons. Now you could work that out in, um, in convert it to a scale reading in grams, and you just multiply by um, 9.8, and then by a thousand to get it to grams. Um, convert it to uh, sorry, yeah, multiply by 9.8 and then um, to get to gram, uh, get converted to grams. Um, is that right? M G. No, divide it by 9.8 to get, yeah, okay. So that's how you can, that's the force. So that's what you'd be plotting. So if I now look at the theoretical relationship, the distance along the bottom, using that uh, formula I just developed and the force up the side you get that sort of shape and it comes out to an average um, relate power relationship of negative 3.3 okay that's going from 5 to 30 now um, the ones I did much earlier was about 2.8 but that was using I think that was using bar magnets like the photo of the girl in the, the image okay now there's the experimental, negative 2.8, and I had that data up there. This is the theoretical value, and you can see they start to diverge somewhere around about here. But 
it looks like um, you're getting a pretty good relationship. So there's a lot there for students to talk about in terms of how well the theoretical relationship and the um, experimental relationship match. Now, I'm going to talk about, so that was really to do with um, the, um, how you could set up a, um, the theory behind setting up a stacked magnets experiment. Now, look, you can see here I've got um, two stacks of magnets. So I've got, what's that, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven magnets on each stack. So I'm looking at the force. So I'd have this little cup. I've just got that in a plastic cup with some brass weights in it to stop it moving. And remember, it's attraction, so it has to be fairly heavy. Um, you don't want it flying off the balance and sticking um, and actually touching. Now, I've changed the the diagram, and I'll the I've changed the way I set that up um, to something I think is a bit better. But let's move on first. The mandatory prac was to investigate the strength of a magnet at various distances. We've covered that. Now we have to identify an experiment to modify. So we've got the experiment we're going to modify, which is the previous one. And we want to extend, refine, or redirect the research focus. Okay, so we now want to think about a rationale for why we do these stacked magnets. So with, now if I go back, a stacked magnet is just really a longer magnet. So this magnet here is seven times as long as um, the one magnet by itself. So what you're really looking at is how the length of the magnet changes the force between the magnets. So how does the force change as you increase the length of a magnet? Okay, and the stacking, stacking magnets is really just um, another way of increasing the length. Okay, so a rationale for the experiment. Now, you'd be saying inverse square seems to be a natural law. So is inverse square a law for stacked magnets as well? I mean, after all, it's a natural law. It's Coulomb's law, law of gravitation, and so on. So you've got this inverse square law. It's, um, what else would it be? Oh, the intensity of light falling off with distance. Um now, you'd need some justifications. Um, you'd be talking about um, how you justify the changes, and you'd be saying, well, I'm going to increase the length because um, I want to see how changing the length changes the uh, force between the magnets. And the research question would be, how does the strength of a magnet change with increasing length? And here we go. So. Unlike the diagram I had before, which was just a single pair where you're changing the distance between the magnets and you're keeping one magnet each time, this one is starting with one pair of magnets and then going to two magnets in each stack and then you know three magnets and four and five magnets. Now keep in mind QCAA said you really need five variations on the independent variable so I've got three variations, but I'd do, you know, one, two, I'd do three magnets, four magnets, five magnets. But why not go six magnets? And, you know, if you buy these, I mean, that whole stack of magnets here, the 30 magnets, I mean, that only costs, I think it's only about $15. So, you know, there's no problem. Okay. So now you're using, you know, one of the, the research question can often involve a claim that you're having a look at. And your the research question could be, are magnets stronger when stacked? Because you think if you put two magnets together, you'd have extra strength because you've got two together pulling out, but pulling on something. But don't forget the, the between the two magnets, they tend to cancel out. So, you know, you're not really... You are, it, you know, it would appear to be stronger, but maybe not double. If you put two magnets together, you're not getting double the strength. Okay, now I've seen this online. This is just a quote from the internet. It said, by adding, and this is actually from a seller of magnets, by adding one magnet to another, the stacked magnets will work as one bigger magnet and will exert a greater magnetic performance. So that was a quote off the internet. And the other, the rest of the quote, oh, here's the source. It's a company 
um, first, first for magnets that actually sells them. As more magnets are stacked together, the strength will increase until the length of the stack is equal to the diameter. So the diameter is eight millimeters for these little magnets that I was telling you about. So once the stack is at eight millimeters long, in other words, about three magnets, um, the, the strength will no longer increase. Okay, so what it's saying is that it should increase um, regularly for the first three, and then once it reaches the diameter, it falls off and basically goes to zero. Well, that's what the students are going to test. And you've got the theory behind it. And let's see how we can do this. Okay, so I'm going to do it with um, having equal numbers of magnets in each stack. So there's the distance, the separation distance. I've got eight magnets in the top stack. And what I've done is I, I glue the first magnet on. That's just a pencil. Glue the first magnet on to hold it in place because otherwise you've got no way of clamping it in a clamp. And on the bottom, I've got the first magnet glued on. Now, here's a bit of a trick um, that I think I should suggest to you. If you want to use um, a, um, do it like this and use a vernier caliper, um, look, I'll just go back and show you what this bottom thing is. Now, I just made this up. All it is, is um, you can see it there. It's just a piece of wood with a pencil sticking out of it um, and I've glued a magnet on the top okay now the whole purpose of that is is, is so that you can get your vernier calipers in to measure the distance between that magnet and the next magnet up and you've got you need some room in there to get the vernier calipers in now, if you're trying to use a ruler to do that you're not going to get um, you know it's going to have a lot of um, uncertainty in the with the measuring instrument so to me that works pretty well and now i've used a nice heavy base so it doesn't move around on the um, scale on the electronic balance so that seems to work all right okay so um, that's how i'm doing it so here's the setup um, and you can see i've got the um, that little piece of wood there i've got four magnets in each stack and there'd be a scale reading here. You can't see it at the moment, but you can see I've got it nine millimeters apart. Okay. So I've said you need a heavy base to stop the magnets moving sideways. Right? You don't want it moving around. In fact, I put a bit of blue tack under there. Just be careful. Don't push down on the pan because you'll you'll wreck the the, the um, electronic balance. You'll you'll break the little strain gauge that's in it. Take the pan off. If you're going to put blue tack on it, stick it to the pan and then gently put the pan back on. Okay. So here's, now I'm, I've done duplicates here. Now I know QCAA said do triplicates and I've always got my students to do triplicates. And in my textbook, I say do triplicates. So here's the first one. Now they're nine millimeters apart. And you can see I've got the um, vernier at the bottom, nine millimeters for each. And I took these. Um, I didn't actually take them straight after one another. I did it first and then I did it again. Okay, students are often think, well, I'll take one reading, there it is there, and then turn the head sideways and then look at it again and take the same reading. Ah, I don't think that's very, um, very good. I, I think it's better to do it twice. Um, anyway, so. Um, I'm getting readings of 34.61 and 34.19 grams. Now you can convert those to newtons by dividing by a thousand and multiplying by 9.8. Okay, so that's trial one, one plus one. In trial two, I've done the same thing, and um, but I've used two magnets in each stack. And you just have to clip these on. This this can be done really quickly once you get set up, and then adjust it to nine millimeters. And then take your reading. Now, the reason I've done this in so much detail is for people who can't get to laboratory equipment, they haven't got access to balances and maybe magnets and clamps and verniers and stuff like that. Now, for some reason, the stu students might not have access. It might be doing something by correspondence or it might be students are at home, they're locked down or they're sick or something like that. 
Now they could come to this and you could direct them to this video or this PowerPoint, uh, the PowerPoint slides that go with it and say, just get this data off there. It's second hand, but you can do it. So I'm allowing time for students to write down the two readings. So two plus two, there's the two readings. Okay, three plus three, write it down, 110.26, 106.54, let's move on. Now you can, if you, I'm going to quickly, you can just slow this video down and um, get the data or go to the PowerPoint that's linked to it. And you'll see that on the website, the next line down, four plus four. And you can notice you're getting a bit of error creeping in here, a bit of, um, uh, if, uh, it's a word uncertainty between the two readings, max minus min type uncertainty. So two different readings and you can work out an average, but that'll be um, good to have error bars because you'll have a maximum value and a minimum value. Okay, five plus five. Look, I'm going to go a bit faster now because I've done quite a few and you can stop the video um, to get these this data or go to the PowerPoint slides. Six plus six. 154, 7 plus 760. So you can see it's getting greater and greater. 8 plus 8, 9 plus 9. Now look, I've written on a bit of paper here just so that it's not confusing about what we're, um, what the various things are. Still 9 millimetre um, separation. Still the 8 millimetre diameter magnets, 3 millimetres thick. And there's the scale reading. 10 plus 10, 11 plus 11. 12 plus 12, and so on. Now, I'm going to go faster because I think I go up to 17, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we're up to 197 grams. Um, and then, oh no, I'm going further, 18. All right, so I got up to 18 in each stack. Now, I could then put that data into that formula I had before, and we can plot it. Now, just a reminder, QCAA advice, Five data points. Well, we've certainly got that. I've got 18 and three trials. Now, I only did two, but this is just, um, you know, a presentation for teachers and, well, and for students if they're watching. So here's some of my data. Now, look, I haven't put all of the data in. I don't want to do your job for you, but there's a number of magnets in the top stack, and here's a number of magnets in the bottom. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, and then there's six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to 18. I've written some of the data down there. That's the scale reading for one balance uh, for the first trial or test, and the scale reading uh, for the second one, and you can write them all in. Now I've converted that to force by dividing by a thousand and multiplying by um, nine point eight, and I've done the same thing for force two, and then worked out an average. And delta, sorry the um, Uncertainty delta is related to difference. So it's max minus min on two. So it's here, it'd be maximum 3392 minus 3351. Take those two away and divide by two when you get that. Now you'll, some students will say, how come, shouldn't that be zero? The difference is zero and divide by two, it's still zero. I think you've got to remember that even though um, the readings were that there's a um, uncertainty in the fourth decimal place there for a digital scale and the rule I've mentioned in the textbook in well it's actually in unit one textbook it's um, in the toolbox in the first textbook um, we say to use plus or minus the last digit so it'll be zero 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 one that's what I've got here Okay, so I've done that for all of those, all the way up to 18. I've left them these um, out for you to do. And then I've worked out a percent, um, percent uncertainty, which is that value divided by the average times the times 100. And we get those as the uncertainties. Now you can use that for the error bars if you like. Okay, now I'll put that formula here. Um, let's see what we've got. Oh, that's just what I was talking about, about the... Um, the, the um, scale reading uncertainty for a digital scale. Okay, now if I plot it, there's the experimental data in blue. Look how beautifully 
Uh, that matches the theoretical value. Now, the theoretical is nice, a smooth curve. And my experimental, there's a few jagged bits here and there. And, um, but it's, you know, it's pretty close. Now, um, the number of magnets is, I've said here, is a proxy or is an equivalent to the length of the magnet. So the number of magnets, if you multiplied each one of those by three, you'd get the length of the, the stack in millimeters. Um, you could plot that or you could, or you could label it as number of millimeters uh, in, or the length of the stack in millimeters. I'm just doing it in number. It's just easier to look at. Now you can see here, there's hardly any error between these points up here. They're all very close. Down here, you're getting a fair bit of error. Um, and up here, not. Now that formula for the theoretical depends on the value that you've chosen for the um, surface magnetization of the N45 type magnets. Now I've um, I've, to uh, I've told you it was 0.44 Tesla, but if you change it to 0.43, for instance, you find the orange graph comes down on top of the blue one, and these are much, much closer here, but then they're further away here. But the point, the the main thing is, is for students, is not to think they have to get the exact value, but you're talking about how you measure this, how you analyze the data, how you look at the limitations of the data, how you generalize and all those um, things, and then draw a, draw a you know, valid conclusion, a justified conclusion. So you can do that with this. So let's have a look further. Now, um, Let's have a look at just the, first, the early part of that, rather than looking at the whole lot. Let's have a look at the first three magnets. As I said to you before, the, um, the manufacturer said it's linear up until the first, until the, the length of the stack is equal to the diameter, which is about three magnets takes us to about nine millimeters. Okay, and the diameter is about eight, so around about there. Now that looks pretty linear. But what I've done is expanded in the next little bit. So I've looked up to, you know, zero to eight. Um, now it's got a bit of a curve there, but look, the first three, could you imagine they look pretty linear? I'm not so sure. So there's a lot to talk about there. Um, now, oh, I'll leave it at that for the time being. Um, you're really commenting on this this um, statement as more magnets are stacked together um, until the length of the stack equals the diameter. So it starts to curve off after, you know, three, it starts to curve. And you can see back to this one after a few magnets, look, it's up here, it's almost um, flat. Okay, so you're not quite confirming that um, manufacturer statement. Now, what I wanted to do was to make this a bit simpler. Um, instead of using um, the same number of magnets in each stack. You just use one magnet in the bottom stack and you increase the number of magnets in the top stack. And then the distance doesn't have to be changed. It's always nine millimeters. So I've got nine millimeter distance. I haven't said that, but the distance. And all I do is plonk one magnet after another on the top and get a reading. So you just click on one magnet, add another magnet, take a reading, add another magnet, take a reading. Now I made a little video of this. Um, it goes for 1 minute 36 seconds. I'll let it run, but um, you can skip ahead if you're not doing this or you don't want to see it. Okay, here we go. Okay, you can see I'm just adding magnets and you can see the scale readings going. So I've given you enough time to write down the new reading. Oops, that one went off to the side and they just click in place. Now, they're pretty brittle, so I did, a couple did crack. So you're just doing this. Now you can see the jump in scale reading is getting less and less. Look, it's, it's, it's only about half a gram. Right, it's about 0.3 of a gram now. So it's really tapering off. So I keep going up to um, 34 magnets. Now, I'm going to let this run 
um, we're up to 18, 19, um, because some of you might want to get the data, and this is only for one trial, but it's um, interesting to plot and to try out various um, bits and pieces with that formula, trying to get the formula right. But I think it's a good, um, good video for you to see how I've done this. That's just a piece of metal, aluminium, U-shaped piece of aluminium in the clamp to hold the magnets in place. I've got the bottom one glued in. Okay, 32, 33, and lastly, 34. Okay, so that's my 34 pieces of data. And here we go. Now, my experimental, that's what you just saw in the video. You can see is in the blue line. There's the um, theoretical using 0.44 Tesla as the surface magnetization for those rare earth magnets. Okay, now you can see here, look how close they are. But down here, there's a bit of a difference. Now, if I change this value, the theoretical value, to say 0.43, what happens is that orange graph comes down. Okay, so it comes actually comes below the blue one, but these meet up here, they're much closer here. And when you do an error analysis of the whole thing, you find using that 0.43 is even better. Um, you get it um, less error. But, you know, you're just talking about the, the data you've got. Okay, so there's a number of magnets in the top stack. And remember, you've got one in the bottom stack. Now, the question is, how can you compare those two values? Now, I don't know what you... It's easy when you've got linear graphs. You can just look at the gradient and the max and min values and compare the gradients and talk about the how close the gradients are to each other and take it from there. But you've got no real gradient here. It changes all the time. Now, some people would just average the two and say, how do the averages compare? But you can't do that. You can't work out an average for a, a curve like this and expect to be able to compare the averages. Um, that just doesn't make sense. So there's a couple of ways to do it. Now, let's have a look. The first way is to determine what we call the coefficient of variability, CV. You calculate the residual, the difference for each pair of data points, and then calculate the mean and standard deviation of these residuals. So going back to this, so you'd work out the difference between this pair, and you'd write it down, that pair, that pair, that pair. So you'd write all these differences down into a Excel spreadsheet um, and work out the mean and standard deviation of those differences. Now that's called the residuals. Each one of those is a residual. That's the residual between the accepted, which is the orange, and the experimental. So as I said here, calculate the mean and standard deviation of the residuals, and you calculate the coefficient of variability um, of the residuals. Now I'll show you that. And we say if CV is less than 1, then um, the data sets are said to be similar. OK, so um, here's my value. There's the residuals and the coefficient of variability um, is 0.43. Now, you, the other thing is, if it's less than one, I think I've said, oh, here we are here. So it's less than one, we say the data sets are similar. So a student could do that, calculate the CV and be happy with that. OK, now the second way might be simpler. All you do is plot a, what they call a QQ graph. So you plot the experimental value against the predicted value. And if it's one, one is to one, you mean it means they're an exact copy of each other. Here, I've done that. And there's a bit of a curve, um, and we can get an R squared value. But you could look at that, and you could say um, the experimental, which is the Y value, is 1.0074 times the accepted value. And so you'd say it's not 1. If it was 1, it would be 0 error. But here it's a little bit different. So um, that's just another way of commenting on it. Um, a gradient with 1 is is good, uh, would mean they're exact, and a high R squared, well this is pretty high, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0.99, 0
but it could be better that if there's no gap there. There's something going on in the first um, little bit that's a bit out. Okay, and because of that, you can say 99% of the experimental values can be predicted from the model, and the model is that formula there. So I think that's working pretty well. Now, if you're trying to find this video, obviously you've got it from YouTube, but I've got the link on my web page. If you scroll down a little way into the year 12 stuff, you'll see that. I go to go to that link and look for this little topic here, and um, you'll see both the YouTube videos for both of those and the PowerPoint. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. So that's it. Thank you.